Well, Anson Genesis is an apologetics ministry, and that means we teach people to defend the Christian faith. We equip people with answers. Uh, a lot of you, I know, have been to the Ark Encounter. How many have been to the Ark Encounter? I uh, see some of you haven't. Uh, you need to get down there. Let me just show you a 30-second video. Here. So if you haven't been there in a while, you know some differences. We have a big 2,500-seat conference center there now. We have workshop rooms in the science lab and a virtual reality ride where we take you back to Tom and Noah. And we've expanded our zoo at the back. And we have, of course, all the exhibits in the ark itself. And it is actually just recently Attractions Magazine. It's a secular magazine. I uh, came out with an article based on Google searches and all sorts of other information as to which attractions were the leading attractions in each state and so they mapped them all out because you can imagine Florida, the Disney parks, California, the Disney parks, Kentucky, it was the Ark Encounter. Uh, so we thought that was really good. And actually you often see articles in the newspaper now, you know the two biggest tourist impacts in Kentucky because of the Ark and the Creation Museum and because of Kentucky's history, the two biggest impacts are bourbon and the Bible. So we do the Bible bit, we don't do the bourbon bit. Uh, but <laughs> see, Kentucky's known for Kentucky bourbon and the, and the Kentucky Derby too, I guess. Well, the Creation Museum uh, was opened actually 14 years ago. The Ark was opened five years ago. We've had millions of people come to the Ark and the Creation Museum. And uh, the Creation Museum, we've expanded a lot. Actually, about two years ago, or just under two years ago, we opened all the new section. We, rebuilt a third of the Creation Museum, added in new exhibits. We've added in a pro-life exhibit, which is the most powerful in the world. Upgraded our planetarium to a laser projection system, put in a 4D theater, and we just opened an exhibit on Israel as well. And both of these places proclaim the gospel and really challenge people. We've had a lot of people come to know the Lord uh, through these facilities. So I encourage you to come down and visit and come down and visit again. Uh, once uh, the roads are not under construction, it'll take you less than five hours. So, I come from Australia, and I thought I'd introduce today with just a little story that happened a few years ago uh, when we're over in Australia, because we have family that still live in Australia. There's no, really, hardly any Christian colleges to speak of in Australia. It's a very secular nation, very pagan culture. But we, when we're over there, uh, one of our family members was graduating from a secular university. And so we went along for the graduation ceremony. It was interesting because it was a big auditorium. There were thousands of people there, and there were all these graduates uh, sitting uh, there together. And on stage, we had all these academics, and they'd invited a local judge uh, to give the commencement address. And so this local judge gets up, and she looks at all the graduates, and she says, well, graduates, here you are. You're about to receive your qualifications, go out into the world, and then you're wondering, what are you going to do until you're dead? And I said to my wife, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> and then she said, you know, that, that's what I was like. I was thinking once I graduate, what do I do until I'm dead? And I said, I said to Mally, wow, this is, they're going to be encouraged by this. And she said, so I wanted to share with you, she said, you know, you're going to have various impacts on your life and they will impact what you will do until you're dead. And she said, so let me share uh, three books in particular, she said, that greatly impacted her life. And she said, you'll come across things that will impact your life too. And she said, for instance, one of the books that greatly impacted me was The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I said to my wife, wow, this is going to be fantastic. I, I'm going to have to buy that book. And, and by the way, I did. So, and she said, and as you read through The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the computer, Deep Thought, had been tasked with finding out the true purpose and meaning of life. And then, of course, you read in there what happened. And the answer to the great question of life, the universe, and everything, said Deep Thought, yes, 42. And she said that greatly impacted me as I read that, 42, the purpose and meaning of life. I said to my wife, that's greatly impacted me here today, too. And I was thinking, wow, those students, just think. They're sitting there thinking, what am I going to do until I'm dead? The purpose and meaning of life is 42. I could understand how they must be so encouraged sitting there like that. I was pondering 42 so much that I missed the title of the next book. 
I wasn't too unhappy about that, but, you know, I sort of heard something in the background. I sort of missed it. But I got the title of the third book that greatly impacted her life. She said, and the third book that greatly impacted my life was Zen and the Art of motor Michael, Motorcycle Maintenance. I said to my wife, I've got to buy that one, that's for sure. I did, by the way, started to read it. You know, the mythos over Logos argument states that the rationality is shaped by these legends, that our knowledge today is in relation to these legends as a tree is in relation to the little shrub it once was, and one can gain great insights into the complex overall structure of the tree by studying the much simpler shape of the shrub. Anyway, I never finished the book, but she was talking to these students, and she said, so you see, students, these books greatly impacted my life, and they'll impact me until I'm dead. And so you need to go out there and see what's going to impact you until you're dead. Wow. Then she sat down. And those academics on stage got up and gave a standing ovation. You can imagine. Wow, what a message. 42, go out there until you're dead. I said to, I said to Mally, you know, if I was one of those students, I'd probably jump off a cliff right now and get over and done with. <laughs> but do you know what she was really telling them, that's the message of the world. Because it was a message of hopelessness and meaninglessness. Where you're here, then you're gone, you're dead, that's it. What a message of hopelessness. But that is the message today of the secular education system, the media. It's a message of many of our politicians. It's the message of the world. Because you know, one book she wasn't impacted by, that she didn't mention, was of course the book she needed to be impacted by and the book those students needed to be impacted by. And you know, we're seeing increasing numbers in America of students who are no longer impacted by that book, which is the only true book, the only infallible book. It's God's book of history to us to tell us who we are, where we came from, what life is all about. And because there's an increasing number of the younger generations who have no longer been impacted by that book, we're seeing the whole Western world, in fact, becoming less Christian from a worldview perspective every day. And you look at America and what's happening. You could actually describe this culture this way, Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which is right in his own eyes. You know, when people say to me, what has happened to America? It's very simple to understand. You take generations of kids and you tell them the Bible is not the absolute authority, that man determines truth, and ultimately anything goes. Anything except the absolutes of Christianity. You know, when people look at our culture today and, and, and they see the increasing hatred of Christianity, the increasing intolerance of Christianity, and you also see many of these secularists and people in the LGBT movement and so on that are accusing Christians of hate speech. This is what I wanted to really help us understand today. You see, there's a worldview clash in this culture. You know, I've talked to some of these LGBT people and they'll say things like, oh, all we want is freedom for our views. We want to allow all views in regard to gender and marriage. And I say, well, no, you don't. And they say, yes, we do. They say, you people are intolerant because you won't allow all views. Well, wait a minute. You're not allowing our view based on the Bible that there's only two genders and marriage is a man and a woman. And they say, but you're intolerant of us. I say, no, wait a minute. You're intolerant of our worldview because you're not allowing all views. You're allowing anything except the absolutes of Christianity. And you see, it's a worldview clash up here, and therein lies the problem. We've got to understand what the real battle is. And the real battle is not up here at this worldview clash. And if we don't come to grips with that as God's people and know how to deal with these issues, we're not going to be successful in reaching this culture and the younger generations. And that's really what I wanted to talk to you about this morning. You see, there's a tornado of moral relativism that's ripping through the culture, and it's dragging generations of our kids with it. There's an incredible exodus from the church in America, as I'll show you here in a moment. And now we're seeing these sorts of issues permeating the culture. Gay marriage, abortion, euthanasia, pedophilia, racism, gender issues. But here is another problem, and that is that many in the church look on them as different problems. Did you know they're not different problems? Did you know that all those are the same problem? They're actually different symptoms of the problem. See, the problem is they build their thinking on man's word. When you build your thinking on man's word, if man's the authority, who decides right and wrong? You do. It's all relative. But when you build your thinking on God's word, who decides right and wrong? God, because he created us, because he owns us. 
And so you see up at this worldview level, there's a clash because it really reflects what's happening at a foundational level. It's a battle between people who want to be their own God and the true, the word of the true God. And so I want to talk about why that problem exists in our culture. You know, it's interesting. A lot of people look at our culture today and they say, look how bad America is getting. Look how bad the schools are getting. Look how, how bad the whole culture is getting. I'm going to say this. We should be asking the question, what happened to the church? Now, when I say the church, I don't mean all churches, but I mean the majority of the church. Because in America today, much of the church is very lukewarm. And we're losing the younger generations from the church. There's an incredible exodus from the church. And it's interesting, the exodus from the church has coincided with the increasing secularization of the culture. You see, I believe it's really the church's fault as to what's happened uh, in this culture as we see that exodus from the church. Now, it's already occurred in Canada, in the United Kingdom. You know, in England, church attendance overall is down to 4%. And in Australia, it's about the same. But in the United States, church attendance has been dropping markedly in this nation. In fact, this is Pew Research from 2010 from the Pew Research Center, and they divide groups into generations depending on when they were born. Uh, so those born before 1928 in that particular generation, 56% went to church. Actually, if you go way back in America's history, it's about 70% of people went to church. So 56% for the greatest generation, 44% for the silent. I'm in the baby boomers generation, 32% to church. The Generation X is 27%. The millennials, 18%. Can anyone see what's happening here? There's a generational loss from the church. Don't you think the church should be saying, wait a minute, why is this happening? What's going on? And then when you look at Generation Z, and they're the younger ones, and then behind them following is our Generation Alpha. But now they're just starting to get research back in on Generation Z, born between 1999 and 2015, the tr first truly post-Christian generation. What do you notice about American culture? It's become a post-Christian culture. And now the younger generations are the first post-Christian generation. Generation Z, twice as likely to be atheist as any previous generation. And a Gallup poll recently asking people who identified as LGBT, 1.3% of those over the age of 74 identified as LGBT. For baby boomers, 2%. For Generation X, 3.8%. For millennials, 9.1%. For Generation Z, it was 16%. So we're seeing a catastrophic change. In fact, I just posted on Twitter this morning, and it'll go on my Facebook later, uh, about a public school in Florida where the students voted the homecoming queen is a guy who feels that he's a woman. And so you have a transgender person now as the homecoming uh, queen. So it tells you the catastrophic nature of that change that's occurred in our culture. And the very latest data we can get on church attendance in America goes back three years, 2018, GSS Data Explorer. Notice that millennials and Generation Z together now to, down to just over 11%. And so there's a catastrophic loss of the younger generation of the church. People, this has been happening for years. I was speaking about this in my talks in the 80s when I was over here speaking in churches when we still lived in Australia and saying to people, statistics show we're losing two-thirds of young people from the church by the time they reach college age and very few are returning. If the church doesn't do something about this, there's going to be a catastrophic loss. There's going to be a catastrophic change in the culture, and that's what we're seeing. And then we need to be asking ourselves the question, okay, so what can we do to make sure our kids, our grandkids, our Sunday school class, our Bible study groups, our youth groups, how can we make sure that our children aren't tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine as we see what's happening in our culture? Well, to do that, we need to ask a question. What happened? You know, people look at our culture today and say, what's happened to the culture? Do you realize if we really understand what's going on, it's nothing new, right? Because the battle has always been the same. It's just because of the Judeo-Christian ethic that came out of the founding fathers that permeated this culture, you know, even in the past, the older generations, even non-Christians, had more of a Christian morality. Uh, even non-Christians would say marriage was a man and a woman and there were two genders of humans, male and female, and abortion was wrong and so on. And that's what permeated the culture. And so, 
as you see that, you realize that veneer of Christianity that was there has actually been ripped out of the culture. It's been ripped out of the public schools as well. And as it's been ripped off, you know what we're seeing? The real battle that's always been there, which now is actually taking off in a big way. And the battle actually began 6,000 years ago in a garden. When God said to the first man, Adam, Adam, you can eat of all the trees. There's just one tree you're not to eat of, because if you do, you'll surely what? Die. In other words, obey God's word. Obey God's word. And then what happened? Along came the devil in the form of a serpent who said, has God said? Did God really say? You can be as God. In other words, I want you to think about this. The first attack was on the authority of the word of God. Right? That's the first attack. It was to get Adam and Eve to doubt and not believe the word of God and that they could be their own God to decide right and wrong for themselves. And so what began back there in the garden was a battle between two religions. This is what we really need to fundamentally get, and that is that there aren't hundreds of religions in the world. In an ultimate sense, there's only two, and those two really start with the foundation of man's word, or God's word. Now, all sorts of things come out of man's word, all sorts of different ideas and things. But from God's word, we have it set right here, the absolute authority of the word of God. And so at a foundational level, this is the clash that's always been there, and it manifests itself in this worldview clash that we see in our culture. Now, when people predominantly, even if they weren't Christians, still got their worldview from the Bible, you can understand how it was a more Christianized culture. But now, when we have these generations getting their worldview from man's word, you can understand what's happening. It's now a more secularized culture. And so now we're seeing that hatred against Christianity. It's interesting, if you jump over to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 11, I'll summarize it for you. He's warning us this. I want to warn you that the devil's going to use the same method on you as he did on Eve to get you to a position of not believing the things of God. That means he's going to use the same method on us, on our kids, on our grandkids. He's going to use the same method that he used on Eve. You know what we should be saying to ourselves? If God's word warns me the devil's going to use the same method on us as he did on Eve to get us to a position of not believing the things of God, I need to know what that method is. And I need to know how that method manifests itself in this time, because the devil is very clever. You see, what is the method he used on Eve? To get Adam and Eve to doubt and not believe the word of God. And what we need to also grasp hold of is the devil is very clever, and even though the same attack occurs, an attack on the authority of the word of God, it manifests itself in different ways in different eras. And what we need to be asking ourselves is, how does that attack manifest itself today? And I need to make sure that I'm preparing my kids, my grandkids. I need to make sure that I'm preparing my Sunday school class, my youth groups, my Bible studies. I need to make sure I'm preparing people that I have uh, impact on to be ready for this Genesis 3 attack so they wouldn't be led astray. You know, it's interesting, when I was growing up in Australia, my father's a teacher and we're transferred around to little country towns uh, every three years as he was promoted. And uh, sometimes, you know, we'd get there, there's only one church in that particular area. But invariably, we'd find a lot of pastors were impacted by liberal theology. And so you know what my father did? He would study liberal theology to make sure he understood what they were saying and then give us the answers to equip us so we wouldn't be led astray. See, he was preparing us for the world we were growing up in so that the devil wouldn't use that method on us uh, and, and be successful in doing it. And so, did God actually say? Actually, if you look at Genesis 3, 1 and 5, where the devil got Adam and Eve to doubt the of men than the praise of God, we'd rather believe the word of man than the word of God. I see that in churches all the time, by the way. The majority of our Christian leaders, the majority of our pastors, Christian academics in colleges, not all, of course, but the majority have in some way adopted evolutionary ideas and millions of years into the Bible and reinterpreted Genesis. They would rather believe the word of fallible man than the word, the clear word of God, and they would rather have the praise of their academic peers uh, than to have the praise of God by taking it as, at his word. And that, unfortunately, has infiltrated uh, much of the church. And see, as you look at that, you say, 
how does the Genesis 3 attack manifest itself today? Well, as I've traveled around the world for the past 40 odd years, one of the things I have noticed is that in today's era, today's time, what has happened is that because of what's being taught in the culture, you, you get the same basic sorts of questions, and they're particular types of questions. You know, if you think back to the time of Peter and Paul preaching on the resurrection, say, uh, in the first century, do you think anyone came to them and asked about carbon dating? Well, it's a 20th century invention. You know, when Martin Luther nailed those theses on the door of the church in the 16th century, do you think anyone came to Martin Luther and said, did dinosaurs go on the ark? Well, the word dinosaur wasn't invented until 1841. It's just an arbitrary term. That's why some people get so confused over dinosaurs. I, I don't see why they do. I, I have some of the older generation say to me, well, if God made dinosaurs, why isn't the word dinosaur in the Bible? <laughs> Same reason the word email is not in the Bible. You know, it's a, it's a made-up modern word. That's all it is. But anyway, that's a whole other topic we won't deal with. But I've noticed as I've traveled around the world that today when people know you're on about the Bible or Christianity, they ask these sorts of questions. Don't we live in a scientific age? Hasn't science disproved the Bible? How do you know the Bible is true? We covered some of these last night in the session. What, what evidence is there for God? Who made God? How did Noah get the animals on the ark? Hasn't science proved evolution's true? How can you believe in a God of love with all this death and suffering in the world? We've heard those questions, haven't we? They're the sorts of questions we get today. And you know, those questions are specifically, if you think about it, they're really dealing with the history in Genesis 1 to 11. See, what I've noticed is in this era we live in, the focused attack on God's word has been on the history in the Bible, particularly in Genesis 1 to 11. And this era we live in began in the 1800s. Because in the 1800s, what happened was this. There were atheists who rejected God's word, of course, who didn't believe in the flood of Noah's day, said, oh, the fossil layers were laid down millions of years before man. And you know what happened? Many of our church leaders said, oh, well, we'll take the millions of years and add them into the Bible. We put them in a gap between Genesis 1-1 1, 1 and 1-2 and invent the gap theory, put them into the days of creation, the day-age theory. And so what arose in history were these ideas, the gap theory, the day-age theory. Who's heard of the gap theory and the day-age theory? Oh, see, we've heard of those because they have infiltrated the church. They've infiltrated our Christian colleges. Along comes Darwin who popularizes his ideas of evolution to explain one kind of animal supposedly changing into another, ape-like creatures into people. And what happened in the church? Many of our leaders said, oh, we'll say God used evolution. And so theistic evolution. Along comes a big bang and they say, well, we'll say God used the big bang. And before long, we have all these different ideas in the church, all these different views of Genesis. And you know, I've had many, many uh, Christians tell me that, well, it doesn't matter if you take Genesis as literal history. And look, this is what scientists are saying, evolution of millions of years. And, and, and so, you know, we've got to somehow accommodate this into the Bible. You know, it, uh, I was on a radio program once with a Presbyterian minister, actually. And he said to me, now listen, he said, you must admit, uh, Christians, different denominations, we can have different views of eschatology, you know, pre-mill, post-mill, R-mill, windmill, treadmill, uh, you know, there's all these different views. Different views of baptism, you know, sprinkling, immersion, different views of speaking in tongues, different views of Sabbath day, and I said, well, that's true. And he, they said, well, and you have different views of Genesis, it's the same thing, but it is not. And if you can grasp hold of this point, we'll start to understand what has really happened to the church and a key to understanding what's happening in the culture. You see, when you have different views of eschatology or baptism or speaking in tongues, primarily we're doing this. Well, the Bible says this here. Yeah, but over here it says this. Yes, but in context it says this here. Uh, yeah, but over here it says this. Primarily we're arguing from Scripture. By the way, obviously not everyone's right, right? Someone has a wrong understanding here. But that's what we're doing. We're primarily arguing from Scripture. But when it comes to the different views of Genesis, we're not arguing from Scripture. Here's what we're doing. Because of what the scientists are saying, because of the millions of years, because of evolution, because of their belief about the Big Bang, we've got to fit this into the Bible. And if you stand back and look at the big picture, here's what has really happened. And this is why we have the Ministry of Advances in Genesis, the Ark, the Creation Museum. This is a key to understanding what this is all about. It's an authority issue. And I know many of the older generation even believe things like the gap theory and think, well, what's wrong with that? But you see, what's happened is it unlocks a door. You know the door it unlocks? 
You don't need to take God's word as written. You take man's ideas and you start adding it to God's word and reinterpreting the word of God. And then as you're impacting the younger generations, yeah, you can believe what you're taught at school about evolution, millions of years. You can believe all that. You can just add it into the Bible here. And therefore, you start giving up Genesis 1 to 11. And before long, they're saying, well, if you can take these ideas and do that, you can take the views of marriage too of the world and reinterpret God's word. And besides which, if the first part of the Bible is not true, how can you trust the rest anyway? That doubt leads to unbelief and off they go. And people, that's what's happened. It's very simple to understand. You see, the devil has made a clear attack on the authority of the word of God. And the other thing that many people haven't realized is when you talk about millions of years and evolution, that's not, that's not science in the sense of something you can prove and something you can observe. In fact, it's religion. You know, if you read Darwin's own writings, do you know why he popularized his ideas of millions, millions of years of evolution and so on? He was trying to come up with a way of explaining life without God by natural processes. Do you know what naturalism is? Atheism. That's what it is. Atheism. And if you think those Christian leaders, and it's a majority of them, who've taken millions of years and evolutionary ideas and added them to the Bible, they've really taken the pagan religion of the age and meshed it with God's word and compromised God's word. No different to what the Israelites did. When you read in the prophets about how they took the pagan religion and then mixed it in with God's word, and look what happened. It destroyed them, and they lost their children. They lost the generations come. You know, at the Creation Museum, which is my favorite attraction, actually, because it's a much more in-depth message of the Bible, at the Creation Museum, a centerpiece of the exhibits is when we walk you through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We walk you through what we call the seven seas of history, a perfect creation, the entrance of sin, the judgment of death. Uh, God institutes a sacrificial system. He made coats of skins for Adam and Eve, the origin of clothing, the first blood sacrifice of the covering for their sin, pointing to the Savior. You also have the promise of the Savior back here. And then the flood of Noah's day, that's why you find fossils all over the earth. And then the Tower of Babel, God gives different languages. That's why we find different people groups, and we did that in detail last night. Not different races, but different people groups. We're all one race. And then God's Son steps into history to fulfill the promise back here to be a member of the human family, the one race, Adam's race, but a perfect man, the God-man, to die on a cross, be raised from the dead, and offers a free gift of salvation. One day there'll be new heavens and new earth to come. But here we are in history right here. We're all waiting for this. And the more you see what politicians are doing, the more you want that. But I got news for you. Jesus said you need to... You need to do business until he comes. So we need to, regardless, be on about the business of the king until he returns. And so here's the point I want to make to us. Do you realize and the reason, the Creation Museum, the burden for the Creation Museum, my burden for that goes back to the 70s as a school teacher, actually. And I always wanted to have this place where people could walk through the history of the Bible to then understand why the world is the way it is. In other words walk through, it was a perfect creation. Ah, oh, this is why there's death and disease and suffering in the world. This is why there are fossils all over the world. This is why there are all these different people groups. And to show that this history explains the world. Not only that, do you realize the first four C's, that's Genesis 1 to 11. Did you know that Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for everything? It's the foundation for the rest of the Bible, the foundation for all your doctrine, the foundation for your worldview, it's the foundation for everything. Now, start to think about what we've been saying. As much of the church gave up Genesis 1 to 11 and adopted evolutionary ideas and reinterpreted it and told generations, don't worry about it, just trust in Jesus, they started to walk away from the church. But not only that, when you give up Genesis 1 to 11, you give up the foundation for all doctrine, for your whole worldview. You know, um, I, I, I even notice... A lot of people don't understand worldview. You know what I mean by worldview? Worldview is the way you think. Where, where does your way of thinking come from? You pull it out of the air? Your, the way, your way of thinking has a foundation, and it's either what? God's word or man's word. That's right. And see, the problem is I find a lot of churches, a lot of people don't understand that. What does it mean to have a truly Christian worldview? What does it mean... Uh, to, to have a foundation of God's word. 
You can open up children's books in churches or, you know, many of our Christian children's books or even Sunday school literature. Not ours, of course. Ours takes that stand in Genesis. But you can open up a lot of uh, those sorts of materials used in a lot of churches. And here's what they'll say. Children, can't you see there's a God? Look at this beautiful world God made. Can't you see there's a God? And and often we'll have books that'll say, God made this beautiful world we live in. But you know, it is not a beautiful world. It's an ugly world. Think of all the death and disease and suffering and horrible things going on out there. And here's what happens. These secularists today in the secular education system and the colleges and so on and media, oh, your parents in church taught you that God made a beautiful world? Look how awful it is out there. How can you say there's a loving God? You're right, there's no loving God. Walk away from the church. But had we taught them a biblical worldview with the foundation of Genesis, they would understand this is not the world as God made it. This is a fallen world. This is a groaning world because of our sin. It was once perfect, but now it is no longer. See, unless you have that foundation, you're not going to have the right worldview to understand the world. So what can we do about all this? We need to be raising up generations to be thinking foundationally, starting from God's word. And let me, again, just help you understand this. How do you build a house? Well, you obviously start with the roof. And then the walls, and then you put the foundation underneath. And you say, that's stupid. You don't build a house that way. You're correct. The way you build a house, you start from the foundation. You've got to have a good foundation, rock. Think of the rock, right, God's word. You build the walls, and you build the roof. Now, I want you to think of the walls and the roof here as representing our Christian worldview, our doctrines, the gospel, Here's the foundation of God's word. Now, there's only two foundations, God's word or man's word. Now, what happens when you have generations of kids, because 85, 90% of kids from church homes go to the secular education system, where in our time, there was a veneer of Christianity in the public schools in the past, but now it's basically been ripped out, and they're throwing out God and the Bible and prayer and creation. They didn't throw out religion. They threw out Christianity and replaced it with a religion of naturalism, which is what? Atheism. And so now you've got these kids that are going to, that are st- those that are still in the church are coming to our churches, and they've got the foundation of man's word, and we're trying to put the doctrines of Christianity and the, and the Christian worldview on the wrong foundation, and it doesn't work. It collapses, and then they walk away from the church. Because, you see, you can't Christianize a secular worldview. You have to start from the foundation and build a worldview. It's why, you know, it it, it just amazes me the number of Christian schools even uh, that use, even some of the home schools that use secular textbooks and think they can add God to it. You can't Christianize a philosophy that's wrong from the foundation up. You've got to rebuild it from the right foundation to have the right worldview. And so we need to be raising up generations thinking foundationally. Have we done that in our own homes with our kids, with our grandkids? Are we doing that in our own uh, churches and so on? Are we raising up generations to think foundationally, beginning with Genesis 1 to 11? And we need to be teaching them apologetics. 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give an answer, uh, an answer or defense. And the word answer comes the Greek word apologia, from which we get a word apologetics, which means to be able to give the logical reason defense of the faith. And so what we need to be doing is raising up generations to be thinking foundationally, equipped with answers to know what they believe and why, and ready to live in this world and pray that they won't be led astray. You know, in, um, in the majority of instances in our churches, you know a lot of what we do, we teach Bible stories. You know what I mean by Bible stories? Jonah and the great fish feeding the 5,000, Paul's missionary journey, Jesus on the cross, Noah on the ark, Adam and Eve. And you might say, but, but don't you believe those? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, two problems, though. One is that we shouldn't use the word story today, I believe. And the reason, and I'll mention that tonight when we talk about evangelism, tonight's uh, presentation is, is, follows on from this one. It's sort of part two, if you like. How then you, do you go out and evangelize a culture that's changed foundation? But... Um, as you, as you think about uh, thinking foundationally and thinking and training up with apologetics, you see, what we do is we tend to teach Bible stories. The word story today means fairy tale, 
And so we really need to words like, we use words like record of or history, history in the Bible, the historical record, because kids get the idea we have stories at church, but we learn real stuff at school. And so because the word story has changed meaning, we need to abandon, I believe, using the word story today simply because of that reason. It used to be in history, but it, it's changed. And the other thing is, yes, we do need to teach what the Bible teaches, but we also need to be preparing them with the right foundation and the right worldview to know what they believe and why and to not be led astray by the Genesis 3 attack of today. And that's where I believe there's been a great failure in many of our homes and churches. And so I wanted to deal with just some current issues and show you how we should have been teaching them and how we should be teaching them. So, for instance, how do we deal with the issues of gender? Now, here's what I want you to go away with this morning. I'm going to ask you, how do we deal with gender? The answer is, you start from Genesis 1 to 11. How do we deal with abortion? The answer is, you start from Genesis 1 to 11. How do you deal with marriage? The answer is, you start from Genesis 1 to 11. How do you deal with uh, death and suffering issue? The answer, you start from Genesis 1 to 11. How do you deal with racism? You start from Genesis 1 to 11. All right, sound like a broken record? Do you realize Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for everything? Think about it. Most churches have given up Genesis 1 to 11. Oh, I've even been to churches with conservative pastors who say it's too divisive to teach about Genesis because there are people in the church that believe in evolution millions of years and so on. So I ignore that. I just tell them about Jesus and so on. Once you've given up Genesis 1 to 11, you no longer have a foundation for the structure and it collapses. Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation of everything. In Genesis 1:27, what do we read? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. You know, there's a very strong hint there that there's only two genders, male and female. Do you know the Bible gives no other options? Just two, male and female. And then Genesis 5, 2, male and female, he created them. All through the Old Testament, you read phrases like this, of man and of the woman, the male, of the female. Even in the New Testament, when Jesus, as the God-man, was asked about marriage, he answered and said, haven't you read, he made them at the beginning, made them male and female, which is Genesis 1.27. Jesus is attesting to the truth of Genesis 1.27. And in Mark 10.6, he says something similar. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Here's my point. Even if you had nothing else, you just got the Bible, regardless of what the world is saying, we should always have been teaching the coming generations that, uh, based on God's word, there's only two genders, regardless of what the world says. Only two genders. Now, science has been catching up to the Bible because we now know in humans we are made of 23 pairs of chromosomes and that have all the information that build us. And there's a pair of sex chromosomes. Males have X and Y, and females have XX chromosomes. They're science confirming two genders, right? XY, XX. That's apologetic. Science is confirming two genders. But do you know what else we need to be saying? But wait a minute. The world is going to undermine, try to undermine this and get your kids not to believe this. So what are we going to hear from the world? Well it's out there. You can go and, and hear it. We need to be listening to what the world is saying so that we are continually making sure that we are training our kids with the right information. One of the things the world says is, oh, but there are exceptions. There are some people that have two X's and a Y, and there's some that have three X's. And Yeah, that's true. Tiny, tiny minority of cases, there are those sorts of issues. But we can explain that from a biblical worldview perspective. Because it was a perfect world, but now it's no longer. And because of sin, God placed upon us the curse of death. And because man had dominion over the whole creation, when man fell, the whole creation fell. God placed upon us the judgment of death. So he lets everything run down so that our bodies will die because of, of sin. We don't die because we're made in the image of God and, and we have a soul that will live forever. But our bodies die. Everything runs down and dies. And so because of that, now there are mistakes copied from one generation to the next and they accumulate over time. But it's not just in the sex chromosomes. You can have mistakes in other chromosomes as well. But that doesn't negate the created order 
that God created two genders, male and female. And you know the other aspect of this? You see, I've even spoken to some of the Generation Z people that are still in churches, and they'll say things like this. But, you know, but I feel if two men love each other, for instance, you know, uh, why shouldn't uh, they be allowed to get uh, married? I, I feel that, you know, if a man feels inside that he's really a woman, he should be able to be a woman. And, but see, here's the point. We should, if they really understood this is the absolute authority of the Word of God, and once you undermine Genesis and once you reinterpret that, this is no longer the absolute authority. But if you understand this is the absolute authority and you understand the sin nature of man, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17, 9, you know what that means? You can't trust your feelings. So what we should be training them is you have to judge your feelings against the absolute authority of the Word of God. And we do know because of sin, it can cause problems for us, but God promises He's not going to let us be tempted above anything that we're not able to deal with when we put our faith and trust in Him. And so that's what we've got to understand and how we should be raising up generations. Well, have you taught your children that way? Are you teaching those who are entrusted to your care that way? How do you deal with abortion? Okay, I want to see if you now know it. You start with what? Genesis 1 to 11, right? When you start with Genesis 1 to 11, the Bible says God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he, them. So stop right there for a moment. What's that got to do with the abortion issue? Actually everything, because the Bible makes it clear we're different to the animals. Humans are different, right? No animal was made in God's image. Now, it's very important for us to understand because also in Scripture, what does the Bible say about humans? He says, do not murder, right? Now, how did God make the animals? He said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures after his kind. How did he make man? Let us make man in our image after our likeness. No animal was made like that. So the first thing we need to make sure we all understand is Humans are different to the animals. We're separate from the animals. And by the way, the, the next part of this verse, which you don't have time to really deal with this morning at all, but let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over all the creeping things that creep upon the earth. Do you realize everything, what, what you see the devil doing, everything that God gives us and teaches and ordains, the devil takes and tries to turn it in the opposite direction and pervert it. Right? He does that with gender. He does that with marriage. He does it with everything. And in this verse here, really, that's helping us understand the foundation for a biblical worldview in regard to environmental issues. Number one, man has dominion over the creation, not the other way around. What do you notice about the animal rights activists today and some of those politicians like AOC from New York and others? And Joe Biden, they have the creation having dominion over man. The Bible says we have dominion over the creation. It doesn't mean we abuse it, but it does mean that we use it for man's good and for God's glory. It also means God provided us with fossil fuels at the time of the flood. It doesn't mean we, can't, you know, it doesn't mean we can abuse the creation using them, but it means they're there to be used for man's good and God's glory. And we also understand we live in a fallen world. Because you know what the modern environmental movement has as basics philosophy? Everything natural is good. But from a Christian perspective, everything natural, so-called, is suffering from the fall. So therefore, because of that, because we live in a groaning world, it might be best not just to leave forests as they are and all the underbrush build up and then cause massive fires that destroy. It might be better to clear that out to protect them it doesn't mean fires aren't good at times, but raging fires might be bad. <laughs> Remember what happened at Yellowstone? Part of what happened there was the environmentalists said, everything is natural, let the fires go, and they destroyed all those forests because we live in a fallen world. So, you know, there's a whole view of environmentalism that starts from God's... That's a whole other area. We haven't, we haven't got time to touch on that today. <laughs> so, you know, I often think about those animal rights activists too. They're out there saying that uh, we shouldn't eat animals because they're our relatives. Well, for those of you here last night, you know, heard what Bill Nye said, evolutionists believe all life is related, so we're related to plants as well. So they shouldn't be eating plants either, which would then solve the problem of that group uh, if they did that. So, 
let's go on here. So I'm going to challenge us, okay? The, when I was a science teacher, I was told to teach the six kingdoms of life. And two of those kingdoms were the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom. But you see, I look at today's world and say, what's the emphasis of the world today? It's to try to get generations to believe we're just animals. So I've got a radical idea for you. You see, as Christians, why just use the same things the world is doing, and particularly when things change? And so, if you use the criterion made in the image of God, why shouldn't we have a seventh kingdom, a human kingdom? See, if you go to the Cincinnati Zoo, just across the Ohio River from Kentucky, we have the Cincinnati Zoo. And if you go to the ape exhibit, they actually have a sign telling you that, you know, you just came to visit your family uh, here at the zoo. And they they really mean that. I mean, they're they're sincere about that. In fact, on this sign, they quote uh, a woman who received a big prize for this. She lived with the apes for many, many years, never been able to talk to them, but she lived with them for a long time. And she said this, and this is the quote they have. We are not, after all, the only beings with personalities, rational thought and emotions. There is no sharp line dividing us from the chimps and the other apes. We humans are part of, not separate from the animal kingdom. You see, that's what they want your kids to believe. We're just animals. And you know what I've heard people say? Get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. What's the difference? We're just animals. What's in your womb is just an animal. Well, no. No, we're made in the image of God. And in fact, (laughs) here's something interesting. There is no sharp line dividing us from the chimps and the other apes. I don't know, every zoo I've gone to has a very sharp line uh, dividing us from the apes and the humans. So, why not the seven kingdoms of life? Now, we also know from science, this is all a part of apologetics and and using true observational science, uh, life is built on DNA. And in sexual reproduction in humans, get DNA from the male, DNA from the female. This is a little bit of the animation we have in the Fearfully and Wonderfully Made exhibit at the Creation Museum, at fertilization, there's a unique combination of information different to the mother, different to the father, and different to any other human being on earth. In other words, what does that mean? You become you, made in God's image, 100% human, right at fertilization. And as that cell then divides and builds our body... What happens? Well, no new information is ever added, which means all the information that makes you, you, is right there at fertilization. You know what that means? Abortion is killing a human being right from fertilization. By the way, not just from heartbeat, but from fertilization. So that's one of the things that we need to understand. That's what abortion is. And you know, you know we could go home and read as a family, Psalm 139 again. As you start to think about this, Fearfully and wonderfully made, when I knit you together in, in your mother's womb, God says, and when I saw your unformed substance. So when your body hasn't formed and the cells are dividing to make your body, it is still you because you're 100% you right from fertilization. See, using science to actually confirm what God's word uh, already says. And that's, it's important to be able to raise up our kids like that. And also be aware of what the world is doing, because this is important too. So what do we see on Amnesty International? My body, my rights. I'm sure you've heard of that. My body, my rights. In fact, Kamala Harris, the Vice President of the United States, just recently, a couple of weeks ago, tweeted, the right of uh, women to make decisions about their own bodies is not negotiable. The right of women to make decisions about their own bodies is their decision. It is their body. Interesting how they say that about the abortion issue, but it seems not with other issues. But our bodies, our rights. Well, here's the interesting thing. Kamala Harris is not following the science because a fertilized egg is not a woman's body. In fact, if it's a male, where'd the Y chromosome come from? And not only that, you know, when you have a kidney transplant, you have to have anti-rejection drugs because your body wants to reject the kidney because it's foreign tissue. Do you realize a fertilized egg is looked on by a woman's body as foreign tissue to reject, but God built an anti-rejection mechanism into the uterus? Isn't that amazing? And you know, at the Creation Museum, we have that wonderful exhibit, the fearfully and wonderfully made exhibit. And of course, one of the things we deal there with too is making sure people understand the forgiveness of God, the love of God, the grace and mercy of God. And we've had 
uh, women who've had abortions, who recognize if they repent of their sin, God repromises to forgive and, and to remove their sins as far as the east is from the west. We've got to remember that aspect as well. So, okay, dealing with marriage. Okay, have a guess where you start to deal with marriage. Genesis 1 to 11. So when you start from Genesis 1 to 11, the Bible says God made man from dust. Not from an ape man, by the way. How can you add evolution to the Bible? Man came from dust. Actually, the Bible says you come from dust and you return to dust when you die. You don't return to an ape man. And then God said it's not good that man should be alone. See that no other animals were made like him. Uh, that's why God brought all the animals to him uh, to name to show that there was none like him. He didn't look at a you know, female chimp and say, she's close enough, I could date her or something like that. <laughs> and so what did God do? He put Adam to sleep and from his side, from a rib, made the first woman. And what was the first recorded words of Adam? This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She'll be called woman because she was taken out of man. She wasn't taken out of an ape woman. She was taken out of man. And if you look at Paul uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, twice in that chapter, he says woman came from man. But then you go to Genesis 2.24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and they will be one flesh. Have a look at that verse for a moment. That's the creation of marriage. Where does marriage come from? The Bible, right? God created marriage, not the Supreme Court justices, not Joe Biden. God created marriage. Marriage is, an or, is a God-ordained institution. So what does that mean, really? It means, and as Christians, why can't we say this? There's no such thing as gay marriage, right? When I, when I write about gay marriage, I put marriage in quotes because marriage is a God-ordained institution. and It was a male and a female. It's a man and a woman. They can call it gay union. They can have whatever they want, but it's not marriage. And then when you look at Matthew 19, when Jesus, and we quoted the first part of this before, when Jesus, who's the God-man, was asked about marriage, and he answered, have you not read, he which made the beginning made the male and female. That's Genesis 1.27, Jesus attesting to the truth of Genesis 1.27, and the fact there's only two genders, and said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they'll be one flesh. That's Genesis 2.24. That's Jesus saying... The history in Genesis 1 and 2, that history is true, and that's the foundation for marriage. But do you realize that Genesis is the foundation for everything? See, think about it for a moment. Genesis 1 to 11 gives us the origin of all the basic entities of life in the universe. Where's sin come from? Genesis 1 to 11. Death, Genesis 1 to 11. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Genesis 1 to 11. Why is he called the last Adam? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we need a new heavens and a new earth? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we have a seven-day week? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we wear clothes? Genesis 1 to 11. Why is marriage a man and a woman? Genesis 1 to 11. How do we know there are two genders? Genesis 1 to 11. Why does man have dominion? Genesis 1 to 11. Why does man have to work? Genesis 1 to 11. Do you want to go on? Do you realize how foundational Genesis is? Genesis 1 to 11. Yet think about it, most of our churches, Christian colleges, Bible colleges, seminaries, not all, but the majority gave it up. And we wonder why we've lost the coming generations and we wonder why we're losing the culture. Because that is the foundation for everything. And you know, one last one here. How do you deal with death, suffering and disease? You start from Genesis 1 to 11. Now I did this a bit last night, so for those of you here uh, it'll be a little bit of review. For those that weren't here, you can repent of not being there, and then you'll learn this too. So, okay, the origin of death. The origin of death is in Genesis. As you're walking through those seven seas in the Creation Museum, the second sea, corruption. See, when God created everything, it was very good. But God said, Adam, as a test of obedience, you can eat of all the trees, one tree you're not to eat of, because if you do, you'll surely what? Die. So, Adam rebelled against God, that's the origin of sin, and death is a consequence. So what did God do? He made coats of skins and clothed them. There's the origin of clothing, right? Start to, it brings everything together. At the Creation Museum, as you walk through and you get to the sacrifice scene, God skinned animals, gave coats to Adam and Eve, right? There has to be 
a covering for our sin. Actually, you know, you think about what it says in the Bible that we be clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus that covers ours, which is but filthy rags, right? And this was a picture of what was to come in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was a setup of the sacrificial system. And just before this, in Genesis 3.15, God promised a saviour, if you understand Genesis 3.15. Now, why does there have to be the shedding of blood? The Bible tells us without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Blood represents life. And so when we sinned in Adam, we forfeit our right to live, so there has to be the giving of life to pay the penalty for sin. Now, the blood of bulls and goats can't take away our sin. Why? We're not connected to the animals. See how important it is to understand this? And so a man brought sin and death in the world, so a man has to pay the penalty for sin and death. But we're all descendants of Adam, therefore we're all sinners. So one of us has to pay the penalty, but we can't, so God stepped into history to be one of us to be the God-man, the babe in a manger, to be of Adam's race, to be our saviour, the perfect man, to die on a cross, be raised from the dead, offers a free gift of salvation. Now, there are many, many Christian leaders and many other Christians that believe in millions of years, but I always challenge people. The idea of millions of years came out of atheism in the 1800s where they rejected God's word and said all the fossils were laid down millions of years before man. But in the fossil record... There's lots of examples of animals eating each other, bones in their stomachs, but the Bible shows us that originally Adam and Eve were vegetarian and so were the animals. We weren't told we could eat meat until after the flood. Just as I gave you the plants, now I give you all things. If you believe in millions of years, in the fossil record, there's examples of tumours and cancer and all sorts of diseases in the fossil record, abscesses, arthritis... If all these creatures were roaming around and all these diseases, but after God created man, he said everything is very good, then God's calling death and suffering and all those diseases like cancer very good. No, it's not very good. In fact, the Bible calls death an enemy. And it says today's world is groaning. So these two things can't be true at the same time. You can't have death and disease as a consequence of man's sin and everything very good before that. That doesn't fit with the belief that there was millions of years of death, suffering and disease before man. That means the fossils and the fossil layers couldn't have been laid down over millions of years. So how do you understand fossils? You start from Genesis 1 to 11, right? If there was a global flood, what would you expect to find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth, which is exactly what you find. And then last night, and we won't deal with this now, said, how do you deal with racism? You start from Genesis 1 to 11, and that fourth sea, confusion. And so after the flood, as people built up on the earth and went through a vague called the Tower of Babel, rebelled against God, God gave different languages, and so we ended up with different people groups, not different races. And we dealt with all of that last night. We're all the same skin color, different shades, and explained it all. Uh, And so here's a history according to the Bible. God made Adam and Eve. They had sons and daughters. We went through last night where Cain got his wife. That's very easy to understand because marriage is one man and one woman. And when you get married, you marry a relative. You just don't marry a close relative today like they once did because now there's lots of mistakes in our genes. But by the time of the flood, lots of people, only eight, went on that ark, had to go through one door. It's a picture of Jesus to be saved. And then... They came off the ark and gave rise to people building up on the earth. They rebelled against God. God gave different languages and then forming different people groups all over the earth. But we're all one race and that's why all have sinned and all need salvation in Jesus Christ. You see how important it is that when you start from Genesis 1 to 11, then we know what we believe, why we believe what we do, equip them with answers to the attacks of today's world so that we pray we can raise up generations uh, who stand on the authority of the word of God, who know what they believe and why, and uh, are able to uh, defend the Christian faith. And, you know, before I I, I finish here, uh, let me just quickly say to you, one of the most important parts of our ministry are the resources that we have out there, and I went through them all last night, I won't do that now, just uh, some of the major ones here, And that is what I did today uh, is 
basically based on this book, Divided Nation. And one of the things I did in that book, I put all the illustrations in there, and there's a lot more in there too, but all the illustrations, there's a link at the front there where you can download those illustrations in Keynote, PowerPoint, PDF, and I've got all the teaching for each illustration there. You can download them free so that you can go and teach this message. We need to get the, this message out there because it's missing from a lot of our churches, and it's missing from a lot of our homes. And then we have a series of Answers books out there. That's Answers book one, and this one is actually Answers book five. But the most asked questions that people ask today, in other words, the top Genesis 3 attack questions of today, and we need to be equipped so that we can teach those answers to our kids and to be able to learn to defend the Christian faith. Uh, how do you raise up generations today to be able to face the giants? And that's really a lot about my testimony and the biblical principles on raising children. You know, I've had people say to me, our kids need to be out in the secular world to be salt. i got news for you. There's a simple principle the Bible teaches us. You can't be salt till you have it. <laughs> And if you haven't put the salt of biblical truth and equipped them with apologetics so that they'll survive in the world out there, uh, how can you throw them out the world to be salt? Tonight I'm speaking on this topic, gospel reset. Knowing that in America, what, what has happened, the whole Western world really, the foundation of God's word from which the worldview came that permeated the culture, that's been changed to man's word. How do we go out there as Christians and, and witness now? And we're going to talk about that tonight. Because one of the things I do in the, in the book, Divided Nation, too, is teach people the right way to argue. You see, a lot of times we argue at the worldview level in regard to all these issues. We've got to know how to ask the right questions to direct the argument down to the foundation and to help them understand that God's word is the right foundation. But that's a whole, whole other issue, and we'll be talking about practically how to do that in presenting uh, the gospel uh, tonight. So we have other books dealing with the gender and marriage war, One Race, One Blood, which we did last night. Uh, this one here, Glass House, my son-in-law and I put together, and that is the classic arguments used for evolution of millions of years in public schools, media, colleges, and so on, refuted. I'd love to see every high school and college age go to that one. It's refuting uh, basic Genesis 3 attack questions of our day. And for kids, Middle school and younger, we have an answer series as well. We asked all these kids, middle school and younger, to write in the questions they have about the Bible. Guess what? They're the same questions the teenagers ask and the adults ask. And they relate to science and the Bible and evolution and dinosaurs and death and suffering and, because they've all been indoctrinated that way. And so this is an apologetic series uh, for those kids, middle school and younger. And even in our rhyme books, uh, we are teaching apologetics to be able to defend the Christian faith uh, at a young age uh, for these children. And so it's very, very important. And I, I tell people, hey, listen, if you want a lot more of this information, you want to really uh, get saturated with this, we have our own streaming platform. We have 4,500 videos on there of all ages. Uh, we have a lot of Spanish materials as well, kids programs, creationist nature programs. There's just so much uh, on there that... Uh, that I encourage you with uh, to be able to show your kids. And I encourage you to subscribe. Go and check it out. You can get a seven-day free trial. You know, I started off by saying that the message of the world, the message of that judge was one of hopelessness and meaninglessness because they have the wrong foundation. And we need to see people have the right foundation of trusting God's word and the saving message of the gospel. You know, I was thinking about uh, that particular judge as she gave that message. Students, you're going to go out there and then you're going to die. As if that's the end of it. I know when I was uh, talking to Bill Nye, um, <laughs> listen to what he said. In your worldview, when you die, what happens to you? You're done. You're done. So why and if that turns out not to be true, yeah. that would be very exciting. Okay, but if you say you're done, so you won't even know you were ever here. Apparently not. So then, why do you care what, what we're doing here? Why do you care about climate change? Why do, why do you ultimately, because ultimately, when all these people die, they're done, and nothing has any ultimate purpose, so why now, does it matter? Now, why does it matter ultimately? So, let's be clear. Okay. What we do is make more people. 
What no. organisms do is reproduce. But, but still, when they die, they're done. So why does it so matter? So my claim... Well, why does it matter ultimately? My claim is that not only your size and shape, number of fingers, eye color, and so on, uh -huh. is a result of the main idea in all of biology, uh -huh. evolution. Uh -huh. Not only is evolution the main idea in biology, but what you feel is also a result of evolution. But, but why does that matter if you're done when you die? I mean, why does, what? It, why does it all be matter? Everyone's done. They won't even know they're here. Why You're does asking this... fundamental existential questions. This is, yeah, this but, is but, great, but, Mr. Ham. But why? The idea is to pass your genes on to the future. To, but they, they're so going to die and be done, too. So but why they'll does... become... It goes on and on. You see the hopelessness of the world? The message of hopelessness of the world. That's why we need to do all we can to get the message of God's word out. Because you know what the Bible also says? It's appointed unto men once to die, but then you're not done. After that, the judgment. And those that haven't put their faith and trust in Christ go to everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life with the Lord. And Romans tells us, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And so we have a message for the world that's very important. And those that go to be with the Lord, there's going to be a time when there will be no more death or sorrow or crying. But you know, the Bible has a warning. For those who have never put their faith in Christ, there's a second death. In fact, it's interesting, a man called Nicodemus, one of the leaders of that day, came to Jesus, and Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. He didn't understand it. How can you be born twice? Or you're born of a woman, but then you need to be born again of the Spirit of God. You need to put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. And as we say to people, if you're only born once, you're actually going to die twice. But if you're born twice, you only die once, and then you're with the Lord forever. And you know, at the Ark Encounter, one of my favorite places is the door. We have one door in the side of the Ark, and inside is the favorite photo spot we have a cross on that door reminding people. I love to see families standing there uh, getting their photograph taken uh, to be reminded that Jesus said, I am the door. My me, if any man enter, he will be saved. In other words, I love to see families reminding their children, make sure you've gone through that door to be saved, that you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And really, that's the reason we built the ark. That's the reason we built the creation museum. It's the reason we have the answers in Genesis ministry. Because I pray that from this morning you understand there's been a particular attack on God's word in our time. It's been an attack focused on the history in Genesis 1 to 11. Many of our families and churches gave it up. We've lost the coming generations. People, we need to stand back and really realize what's happened. And then we need to be making sure we're raising up generations with the right foundation.